Today I will be discussing a topic and my topic today is the way of the servant and before I go into that let us just bow our hearts in prayer. Father in the name of Jesus we just want to thank you for this your Sabbath a day a day in which we can fully rest in you and we can trust you for your promises are true. I pray right now that your word will come forth with clarity that it will come forth with power and i pray that we will not only be hearers of your word but that we will be doers also bless us and keep us in the mighty name of jesus we say thanks amen praise god um you know we live in a world that is you know it's characterized by personal uh accomplishment you know we talk about the me generation it's about self-attainment we learn to put ourselves before others and you know, oftentimes, you know, there is a lack of commitment. The heart does what the heart feels like doing. You know, no one really submitting to anyone after all, um, because we are free. We consider ourselves to be free agents. And you know, personal ambition is something that is often encouraged. And we see this even in the political climate that we're in. We see individuals, you know, grappling for power, for an honor, for an opportunity to let his or her voice be heard. Um, we want to be understood. We want to be acknowledged. We want to be seen. But being a servant, what is that? And that is my topic for today: the way of a servant. And you know, I've been thinking about the whole concept of of servanthood you know it's a topic that is so central to the bible and to our relationship with god and yet for many believers you know the subject of of servitude is often very foreign um yet this is the quality you know that characterizes jesus's life in mark 10 uh verse 43 to about 45 um, James and John, they were the sons of Zebedee, and they came to Jesus and said, um, you know, Jesus, when you establish your kingdom, could you make one of us to sit on the right and the other one on the left? And Jesus said to them, do you really know what you're asking me? Can you really drink of the cup of salvation? And Jesus went on to say to them, that's not the way it sh should be among you. Instead, Whosoever wants to be great among you must be your servant. And whosoever wants to be first among you must be slave to everyone. Because even the Son of Man did not come to serve, to be served rather, but to serve and to give himself a ransom for many people. Um, Paul, in his exhortation to the Philippians, Philippians 2, verse 6 through 9, he said, Who being in the form of God and speaking of Jesus, he said, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men and being found in fashion as a man. He humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore, God also hath highly exalted him and hath given him a name which is above every name. And verse 10 says that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven, on earth, and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Praise God. You know, to understand the context in which the term servant is used let us look at strong's definition a servant usually is usually translated to mean a slave it is referred to someone who was owned or someone who was controlled by someone else they're considered an attendant you know one who gives himself up to another's will 
those whose service is used by Christ in extending and advancing his cause among men. Paul considered himself to be a servant of Jesus the Messiah, called to be an apostle and set apart for the gospel. And this can be found in Romans 1 verse 1. A servant also is one who is devoted to another, who disregards his own interest for the interest of the one whose control and influence he is under. One who gives up, one who gives himself up wholly to another's will. Uh, you know, in the New Testament, you know, we see several variations of the term servant. You know, there were hirelings, you know, these were hired servants employed, employed as day laborers, so to speak. You know, they were hired to do a certain job. You know, they were hired servants that were, you know, engaged by the day and they were paid at the close of the day. In John 10, you know, it speaks of the hireling, the hireling that fleeth because he does not care for the sheep. Some servants were called stewards. They supervised the work of the lesser servants or managed their master's affair. This can be seen in the parable that Jesus spoke of concerning the ten, the talents. And, you know, there were several ways that a person could end up as a slave. You know, there were those that were made captives in war. Prisoners were made into slaves. In 2 Kings 5 verse 2, it says, And the Syrians had gone out by companies and had brought away a captive out of the land of Israel, a little maid. And she waited on Naaman's wife. And we see her later being instrumental in Naaman's healing from leprosy. leprosy. So even in a place of confinement, even in a place of physical bondage, we can still be servants of the Most High. Praise God. There were also children of defaulting debtors. You know, they were sold to be servants. You know, if the family had children, the children would be confiscated by the moneylender. You know, it was very common for the entire family at times to end up as slaves. This situation of the widow that appealed to the prophet Elisha is an example of this. You know, the passage reads in 2 Kings verse 4, it's 2 Kings chapter 4 rather, it says, now there cried a certain woman of the wives of the I'm sorry. No, there cried a certain woman of the wives of the son of the prophets unto Elisha, saying, Thy servant, my husband, is dead. And thou knowest that thy servant did fear the Lord, and the creditor is come to take unto him my two sons to be bondmen. Another way that an individual could end up as a servant or a slave is if it was voluntary. So there was voluntary servitude. You know, this was self-inflicted. A person could voluntarily, you know, sell himself into slavery, so to speak, to escape a life of misery. You know, this was a way that they could have a higher standard of life as a slave, you know, rather than to keep struggling to find food or housing on their own. You know, there were those servants that were bought and sold. Servants were bought and sold as mere objects and became the property of those who bought them. This was the case of Joseph, as seen in Genesis 37. Verse 28, it says, Then there passed by Midianites, merchantmen, and they drew and lifted up Joseph out of the pit and sold Joseph to the Ishmaelites for 20 pieces of silver, and they brought Joseph unto Egypt. Verse 36 of the same chapter 37 states, and the Midianites sold him into Egypt unto Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, Pharaoh and captain of the guard. Thieves also were often punished and, being, and, and, be, and were made into servants. You know, if a thief could not return or pay for what he had stolen, he would be forced into slavery. In Genesis 43, we see where Joseph brothers, you know, they were afraid having left Joseph's house and found that the money was returned in their, in their, in their sacks. 
you know, they thought that Joseph would seek an, an occasion against them and to take them as bondmen. And the last way that an individual could end up as slave is for children who were born of slaves that were automatically, automatically slaves. Now, according to the law of Moses, a Hebrew slave had to work for six years to gain his freedom. When his period of time, which was the Jubilee year, was finished, his master would reward him with a certain amount of money so that he could begin a new life. So let's take a look at this. It was always God's intention for man to be free. You know, he had creation intended for mankind to serve him and in doing so to serve others. You know, in the beginning, you know, we can see the joyful union where man could commune with God. However, after man's disobedience, death entered the world and service became painful and grievous. Through man's disobedience, sin entered the world. So where there was peace stood war. Where there was joy now stands fear and pain and suffering. You know, David in Psalm 51 said, Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. That penalty of death was passed down to us from Adam. But Jesus, through his shed blood on Calvary, paid the price so we can be free from the bondages of sin. The Bible says that we have been bought with a price. He paid a debt that he did not owe. We owe a debt that we could not pay. But when Christ went on that old rugged cross, he took on him our sins, our shame, and he died on the cross. A common criminal, he who knew no sin, became sin for us. So since we then have received the gift of freedom, let us therefore walk ye in him, rooted and built up in him, establishing faith as we have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving, according to Colossians 2, verse 6 through 7. You know, the Apostle Paul, he explains it better. He said, you know what? And I alluded to that earlier. He said, for we have been bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. 1 Corinthians 6, verse 20. In what is commonly called the upper room discourse in John 13 from 1 through about verse 1 through about 20, you know, we see Jesus displaying the heart of a servant by washing his disciples' feet. The Bible said that Jesus poured water into a basin and he began washing the disciples' feet one by one. And imagine 12 pairs of dirty, sandal-clad feet that would have walked the dusty streets of Jerusalem. Cleaning them would have been the job of a servant and a lowly one at that. It was a low servant's job to wash the feet of a house guest. But Jesus took off his outer robe, his priestly garment, a humbling thing to do. And he bent down and scrubbed the grime from off the feet of those men. Peter, he initially resisted the idea that Jesus, the Messiah, the master, the teacher would stoop to such a lowly position to wash his feet. This was not the norm. Leaders were not supposed to serve their followers. But in doing so, Jesus set an example for all believers that we are to serve as he did, love as he did. We do this not through flaunting our positions of authority, but by recognizing who Jesus is. Jesus used this as an example to show that we are to engage in the service to others and of others. He said, if I then, your Lord and master, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet, for I have given you an example that you also should do what I have done. Truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than, though, than one who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. And we see here where Jesus is making the distinction that it's not just about knowing the word of God, 
but it's about but it's about applying ourselves to the word of God and doing the word of God. By this he says in John 13, verse 35, by this shall all men know that you are my disciples if you love one another. You know, when Jesus came, he was about doing the Father's will. In Matthew 6, verse 9 to 13, when he, he taught the disciples, when he taught the disciples the Lord's Prayer, he said, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In the same light, in Matthew 26, verse 29, we see him praying in the Garden of Gethsemane, saying, Oh, my Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as your will. Humbly, Christ came into the world that was filled with woe, you know, having the divine nature of God. But as a man subjected to the same concerns, the same betrayals, the same disappointments as we are, yet he humbled himself even to the death of the cross. He devoted his life to us and disregarded his own interest to the advancement of the whole human race. You know, oftentimes we pray for the for the will of God in our lives, but yet we hold on to the things that would hinder us from accomplishing God's will. I believe it should be the prayer of all believers for God to have total preeminence over our lives. And it should be a prayer, or prayer for us to continue acknowledging him in our words, in our deeds, and in the life that we, that, that, that we live. Jesus says, if any man come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Luke 9, verse 23. Amen? So for as many of you as have been baptized into Christ, have put on Christ, there is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male or female, for we are all one in Christ Jesus, according to Galatians 3, verse 27 through verse 28. The ground has been made level at the foot of the cross. So come all ye that labor and all ye that are heavy laden and he will give you rest. In him, you will find rest. There is refuge in him. There is safety in him. There is assurance in him. There is life for a look at the crucified one. There is life in this moment for thee. Praise God. You know, to be a servant of God means that, you know, we have relinquished all will and we have yielded ourselves to the service of God. It means that we are actively extending and advancing the kingdom of God by allowing others to see his attributes and by displaying his characteristics. You know, I, I don't consider myself to be a hireling or an independent contractor, so to speak. You know, an independent contractor is an individual entering into an agreement to perform a job through the exercise of his or her own methods and is not subject to the control of the individual by whom he or she was hired. So I have to subject my ways to the ways of my master. I have to subject my will to the ways of my master. Amen. Jeremiah declared, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans for welfare, not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. Jesus in speaking says, why do you call me Lord, Lord? and not do what I tell you according to Luke 6, verse 46. Now, how can we know 
the character of a good and faithful servant or what is the character of a good and faithful servant? Luke 17 verse 10 says, when you have done all those things which you are commanded, say we are unprofitable servants, we have done what was our duty to do. Now, if I have done what is my duty, why am I considered an unprofitable servant? A servant is considered profitable when he applies himself with love and with dedication. In order to do what he's commanded, he surrenders himself and he makes himself available always to the service of the Lord. So he, he does not just do the work because it is what he has been commanded to do, but he does this out of sheer dedication to his master. We have to understand that a good servant is one whose character is aligned to the will of God. In the parable of the talents, according to Matthew 25, verse 14 through 30, the Lord considered the first two servants good and faithful. It's the parable of the talents. And it says that they were the ones who, when received, upon receiving their talents, rather, they immediately went and they traded with them. The Lord praised them and considered them to be good and faithful servants. The one, however, did not trade. That's the one that received the one talent. He did not trade, and he basically accused his master of unfairness, wanting to reap where he had not sown. The servant's negligence was quickly reprimanded by his master, who called him wicked, lazy, and worthless. You know, Matthew 7, verse 21 through verse 23, and that is something for us to take note of. You know, Paul said, you know, lest I preach in others and myself be a castaway. Matthew 7, verse 21 through verse 23 says, not everyone who says unto me, Lord, Lord, <laughs> excuse me, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. You know, David in Psalms 51 says, but thou desirest not sacrifice, else would I have given it. You know, thou delightest not in burnt offering, but the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. O oh God, thou will not despise. You know, ultimately, sin enslaves us. You know, and to remedy man's sorrowful predicament and to restore mankind to himself, God sent his one and only son into the world to save us. Peter 1, 1 Peter 1, verse 18 through 19 says, knowing that you are ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb, without spot or blemish. Through the blood of Jesus Christ, we have been redeemed. We have been bought with a great price. And we are no longer enslaved to sin. For our sake, he made himself to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. He saved us according to Titus 3, verse 5, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit. You know, Jesus came as a suffering servant to fulfill what mankind could not. Christ suffered the pain and the penalty which our sin deserved. He, in Matthew 12, verse 18, is called the chosen servant. And we ought to know that we have been justified through and by his blood. Jesus completed the work for us on the cross and gives us his Holy Spirit as our counselor. 
Romans 6 verse 6, Paul puts it this way. He said, we know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. Now, Paul instructs us to continue remembering that we are no longer bound to sin. We are no longer slaves to sin. And therefore, we must not offer our bodies to be used by sin. We must offer ourselves as instruments of righteousness instead. To be a servant is not only to serve, but above all things, to belong to someone. What a privilege and an honor it is to be children of the Most High. You know, it is better to be a servant in God's kingdom than to be masters in the kingdom of the enemy. Amen? Know ye not that to whom ye yield your servants, children to obey, his servants are to whom ye obey, wherein of sin unto death or of disobedience unto righteousness. As chosen vessels, we have to put our flesh under subjection in controlling our impulses, rather. We are better equipped to submit ourselves to the will of God. And in submitting to his will, you know, we are acknowledging that he alone is God. We are acknowledging that he is the maker of the universe. We are the clay and we are in the potter's hand. So it means that we have to relinquish our own right and our own choices for his will. So it means that whatever we do, the decision we make, it has to be aligned to the perfect will of the Father for his ways are higher than our ways and his thoughts are higher than our thoughts. You know, nothing ups upsets a master more than a rebellious servant. You know, there were mosaic laws concerning this, that if a slave runs away and he was found, that he needed to be returned to the master. You know, we see this in Genesis 13. You know, we see when Hagar, you know, she was running away because of Sarah's maltreatment. You know, the angel of the Lord spoke to her and said to her, you know, Hagar, return to your mistress and submit yourself under her hands. And we see here, you know, this whole principle of submission. You know, whoever is our master, we are submitted to. You know, it is a question that we ought to ask ourselves today. You know, whose will are we submitting to? Whose call are we responding to? Who is ordering our stuff? Who is directing our lives? Because no one can serve two masters, for either he will hate one and love the other, or else he will hold on to one and despise the other. We cannot serve God and mammon, according to Luke 6, verse 16. Paul said in, in, in Ephesians 6, verse 5 to 8, that servants, we ought to be obedient to them that are, that are our masters according to the flesh, with fear and trembling, in singleness of heart, as unto Christ. Not with I service as men pleasers, but as servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. With good will, doing service as to the Lord and not to men knowing that whatsoever good thing any man doeth, the same shall ye receive of the Lord, whether he be bond or whether he be free. So how do we serve him? We serve him with gladness. We come before his presence with singing according to Psalm 100 verse 2. You know, 1 Samuel 12 verse 4 says, Only fear the Lord and serve him in truth with all your heart. For consider how great things he has done for you. A true servant is one who is humble, do, does nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility, one who counts others more significant than themselves, one that looks not only to his own interests, but also on the interests of others. It's one that prepares, a servant is one that prepares Rather, train yourself up for godliness, for while bodily training is of some value, godliness 
is of value in every way and it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. A good servant is one who perseveres. It's one who is dressed for action, as one who keeps their lamps burning. And like men wait for their master to come from the wedding feast. Amen. The, the scripture says in Luke 12, verse 35, that blessed are those servants whom the master finds awake when he comes. You know, when he comes in the second watch or the third watch, if he comes in the second watch or the third watch and finds them awake, blessed are those servants. A servant is one that serves where needed. Paul says, I have become all things to all people that by all means I might save some. I do it all for the sake of the gospel that by all means I might save some. I do it for the sake of the gospel that I might share with them in it its blessings. A servant not only serves, a servant serves as God directs. You know, David, he wanted to serve God and honor him by building God um, an edifice, a permanent house, you know, and he drew up the building schematics, you know, he made the plans for all the details of the temple and even talked to the priests and the Levites to make sure that everyone was on the same page. And even with all the preparation that he had done and all the other ways that he had served God, you know, according to Chronicles, First Chronicles 28, it shows that the Lord did not want or allow David to build a temple of God because God said, you know, his hand had spilled blood and it was for Solomon, his son, to build it. But we see David being, you know, God's obedient servant. You know, he accepted this and he made as much ready for Solomon as he could. As faithful servants, let us continue to watch for we know not the hour that the Lord doth come. God commands us to be ready. We are called blessed when the Lord comes and he finds us watching. He finds us waiting. The position of a servant in today's norm is not something that one would ascribe to it's not something that one would aspire to. But in order for us to be, to align ourselves with the character of God, we have to display his attributes. We have to display his characteristics. Amen? And in doing so, we have to be lowly servants. It means that we have to serve in areas that we can and the best way that we can be a servant of God is to align ourselves to the will, the intents, and the purpose of God. There are often times when, you know, we are, we are bombarded, you know, with so many things and the distractions of life. And the enemy would want us to steer away from the plan and the intents that God has for our life. But as we have been reminded today, that indeed we are living in perilous times and times is fast advancing. So many things are happening around us and it's for us not only to be ready, but to stay ready for in that hour that we thinketh not, the Son of Man shall appear. Let us continue to do the work of him that has sent us. Let us continue to labor in the kingdom of God, not for eye service. It is God's plan that all men should be saved. 
and as stewards, as stewards of the gospel that has been given to us, it is our responsibility to speak those things that we have seen and to speak those things that we have heard and to proclaim the name of Jesus to our brothers and sisters. Let us continue to labor in this kingdom, knowing that although we are in this world, we are not of this world. But as the Bible declares that we still have to occupy, we still have to do things until he comes. But at the, at the end of the day, we ought to make sure that our calling and election is sure. You know, that is one of the things that often plagues me. And it is something that centers me and it is that of speaking the word of God, teaching the word of God, singing the word of God. And at the end of the day, my soul is lost. And I'm sure that for many of us this morning, you know, it is a constant introspection, you know, of the self. Because anyone, <coughs> excuse me, because anyone that intends for heaven to be their home, there is a constant search. There is a constant looking into oneself to see where we are, if our will is aligned to the will of the Father. Let us continue to do and to love as Christ has loved us and to serve as he served. Amen. I pray and hope that God will continue to bless you and that God will continue to keep you and I trust and hope that the words that have been spoken today will, will, will resonate with us and that we will take it and that we will continue to apply ourselves to the word and the work of God. God bless you. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we just want to thank you for your words today. We thank you that through your words, God, we have life. We thank you that through your words, God, we can be made free. We no longer have to be enslaved to sin, for we have been bought with a price. We have been redeemed by your love. And because of that, let us, God, continue to walk in freedom. I thank you for what you have done today. May us continue to not only be hearers of your word, God, but to be doers also. Bless the remaining portion of the day's event. I give you thanks for what has been done, and I give you thanks for what will be done in your name. We say thanks. Amen. Thank you.